This is a long talk. Uh, I didn't quite get a chance to, to sort of uh, collate all the all those surveys that you guys filled out. If you haven't filled out one of those surveys, I promise you that data will be put to good use. You know, if, if we get enough people to sort of fill those out, we will see. Uh, we will have some good salary trends. We'll have some good sort of technology trends. Uh, so if you can go to the Meetup page and click on that front end link or that hiring company link, uh, that would be awesome. If you are uh, a hiring company and you fill out the survey, everyone is going to receive in their mailbox a uh, a, uh, a list of basically all the you know, front end jobs that were posted. I think we have like 23 or 24 of them uh, and links to hiring companies. All right. All right. So let's talk about the state of front end development. So we're going to talk about usage trends. So if you're uh, sort of a uh, browser nerd like I am, this is going to be extremely interesting. If it's not, take a 10 minute and a half to wake up, I promise, I promise we'll get better. Um, hello? Hello? All right. Um, then we're going to talk about the browsers themselves. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the new tech that sort of now we can actually use that previously we couldn't really use so much. Um, talk a little bit about the job market um, and sort of go from there. It's a little smaller than I'd like, but let's start here. There we go. All right, so you guys, uh, if you haven't followed this, this is literally just stolen from the Stat Counter website. Uh, we're looking at browser stats for, if you're sitting in back, this is more of like a, a guessing game quiz. What's that big blue line that's heading precipitously down into the right? Can we get a round of applause for that? <laughs> Woo! Uh, so what is, what is that that uh, feisty newcomer in green? Chrome. Yeah. So as you can see, sort of at the end of the past year, with with a nice little bizarre spike, um, Chrome has overtaken IE and all versions of, of IE as the most popular browser in the United States. Worldwide, it is, you know, it's not even close, right? Chrome, Chrome, Chrome is winning. Um, as we can see, sort of part of, you know, part of the uptick in Chrome uh, was Firefox getting cannibalized, um, you know, because the sort of early adopters are the type of people that would, you know, go from, you know, a lot, a lot of people are going from Firefox to Chrome originally, not from, uh, you know, Internet Explorer to Chrome. You can see that that sort of that trend has sort of bottomed out, while minus all the bumps, uh, Firefox, uh, I mean, Internet Explorer keeps losing market share. Um, Safari is significant, but it's not, um, you know, it's it's not huge, right? We're just looking at desktop browsers. So what does that mean? Well, back in the day, there were two browsers. There was I, Internet Explorer, right, and Firefox, and you can sort of uh, you know, you, you could do some uh, user agent sniffing. You could you, know, you could do some tricks and basically say either it's got to work on Firefox or it's got to work on Internet Explorer. That is obviously not the case, right? We're we're literally just looking at desktop browsers. We're not even looking at mobile yet. Uh, there are four browsers, you know, with significant market share. Now, of course, if we break down Internet Explorer, the story gets even worse. Right? There's not one version of Internet Explorer that we have to deal with. There's four. Right? We got 11, 10, 9, and 8. Folks who are sitting on 8 are not going anywhere, unfortunately, because if you're on uh, Windows XP and you don't know what you're doing, you are sitting on Internet Explorer 8, and there's nothing else you can do. Right? Um, Opera, you can ignore. Um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, you don't want to ignore any percentage and sort of any of the four major browsers, you no longer can, right? They're all there and they all need to be sort of dealt with. Um, so takeaways, Chrome is and will be top dog. There's sort of no, no sign of that going away, you know, which, which I'm not complaining about. IE is still trending down, so that trend sort of continues. Um, Firefox is stabilized. I think that's good news because as much as we might want everything on WebKit as front end developers, that's obviously not going to happen anymore. Um, so it's good not just having a monoculture of you know Google versus Internet Explorer. Um, in many ways, sort of uh, Firefox is the only person, I don't know how to actually say that word, 
uh, of the web, right? They're the only people who you can really argue are fighting for, you know, Mozilla is kind of the only people who are fighting for, you know, the internet user. Everyone else, you know, Google, that ship has sailed, the whole don't be evil ship has sailed through Google. Um, they're clearly a monster corporation that has their own sort of agenda. I think Chrome is awesome and what they're doing is awesome. Um, internet, you know, Microsoft, I don't have to convince you guys that that might not be the most user-friendly uh, corporation out there. Uh, although they're doing a lot better recently. Um, but sort of Firefox is the last sort of bastion of the user. Um, so I, it would be in our best interest that that sort of you know, doesn't go away. And I say this as a person who uses Chrome. <laughs> um, if we're going to sort of break down our next board, we're looking at uh, 98, 99, or say around 13% in the United States. Um, why is that important? Because if we take 100 minus that, that means 80, 87% of the population is surfing the web with a reasonably modern browser, right? Um, in theory, Microsoft has moved to uh, a uh, auto update, a auto silent update on uh, on their browsers. If you can run IE 10, you can run IE 11, right? Not everyone has necessarily upgraded uh, as of yet, but most of the people who are on IE 10 are moved to IE 11. Um, it's really just those suckers who are sitting there, right? If you were on Vista, you're not going past the IE 9. If you're on XP, you're not going past the IE 8. Um, Unfortunately, that means that 13% is probably going to stay relatively consistent. There's not that much we can do. Um, but that does mean that we're, we're up in the 90s now in terms of support for S SVG, Canvas, and HTML5. Oh, you know, because, you know, i 9 is not i 8 It's a little bit better. <laughs> um, so on the mobile side of things, um, what, what, what do we think sitting at the top, at the very top right? What's the blue line that sort of went? iOS. It is iOS, right? So uh, can anyone explain that pink line of Android going going down aggressively? Is that really what's happening? No. no. It's that, that, that green line coming up is the greatest thing to happen to you as a web developer. Um, the higher that gets, the happier you are. That pink line is the Android stock browser, which is every you know Android 2.2 device or 2 device cannot upgrade past that. They're sitting on a stock browser. We'll talk in a second about why that browser is terrible. Uh, everyone on sort of mobile Chrome is, is getting a latest generation browser, right? Chrome has not quite a pretty close to feature parity with desktop Chrome. Uh, mobile Chrome is a massively impressive uh, piece of software. Uh, there, there's sort of some other sad things going on here. So the, there's two different green lines. What's this first green line? This is the sad fate of Black Bear. Yeah. It, it is amazing that the percent of the market that they have um, sort of to, to fade away. Um, can anyone count out the IE Mobile line? Mm -hmm. Nope, you cannot. Um, it is hanging out down here. Um, and I don't mean to just you know grab on Microsoft, but it is actually I am very happy that on mobile we have a little bit of a monoculture. It's not a sort of a it's not really a WebKit monoculture, but uh, uh, but Chrome and iOS both share sort of a WebKit backend. Um, we'll talk about how that's that's not exactly the same. Um, Overall, and this isn't represented in the graph, but mobile has now reached a third of web traffic. So if you put mobile and tablet together, that means one third of your traffic, obviously, where you are specifically, um, it, you know, what site you're working on is going to affect that dramatically. Um, but general, in general, one third of the traffic is coming from a mobile device, which is pretty crazy, right? Considering the number of websites out there that are utterly <coughs> Sort of unusable on mobile, you know the pinch, the pinch zoom websites. Um, so you know we're going to keep an eye on that number. Uh, it's probably going to grow, um, but it's uh, you know we, we kept talking about year after year. Oh, 10 percent, 33 percent is pretty significant. You can't ignore one third of the people visiting your website. Um, 
So this is the number you know you find in various places on the web, and at Alignable where I am right now, that uh, that number is a little bit low. We actually get more than that. So it's very much a real number. Uh, Apple is still in the lead in the U.S. just barely. If you add together Chrome, uh, you know, the Chrome for Android, uh, and the Android 2 browser, uh, it's just a hair below um, uh, iOS worldwide. Android is is killing Apple. Um, uh, Android is also shipping way more units right now. Um, what that actually means in terms of what people are using. Um, it's a little weird. It's actually a little weird that uh, Android is not absolutely destroying Apple, being the number of units overall that are getting sold. Um, but you know, people must hang on to their iPhones a little bit more. Um, again, the install base means something. The number of people, you know, in a couple of years, this is going to shift uh, most likely dramatically. Um, again, Windows Phone and BlackBerry on mobile. Right now, I'm at MIA. You can kind of safely ignore them. Um, and this is kind of the, the, the big takeaway, right? Android 2 is kind of the new IE6. Uh, it is by far the worst mobile browser uh, you can get. And much like sort of like Internet Explorer uh, 8 users on XP, they kind of don't have that much of another option. You can use mobile Firefox. Performance is, you know, I, I would, and I use Android now, so I'm not just saying horrible things about it. But uh, from a performance perspective and a smoothness perspective, uh, anything before I think Android uh, 4.1 is kind of rude. so if you if you're you know playing game HTML5 games or something on your um, you know on your stock Android phone uh, Android phone it's, it's not going to be ideal. Um, so just to sort of clarify, um, the one that we're not a huge fan of is that Gingerbread sitting there at 16.2%. Um, and that number is much higher worldwide than it is the United States. Um, but, you know, the 50% of all Android devices, this is pulled straight from the uh, Android developer website, um, are, are running more or less a end of life uh, version of Android that's not going anywhere. Um, if we compare that with iOS, see if I can do this without leaving. Um, you can see that from you know, this past March, when iOS 7 uh, one was not released, um, you know, up basically uptick is, is much much higher. Um, it's nice that uh, almost every iOS device is running the latest sort of the latest gen browser, um, but the unfortunate reality is that we can't do more sort of Android. All right, so we also have to deal with the great. <laughs> WebKit schism. So uh, Google forked WebKit to Blink back in April 2013. Um, so far, that hasn't affected us as web developers. Um, really, you, know, you haven't noticed a huge difference in rendering engines, but that means that sort of um, uh, that means Chrome and Safari iOS no longer all share the same rendering engine. And like for this one brief period of time, we sort of had this world on mobile where everything was WebKit. And we could sort of count on the same, you know, on feature parity to a certain extent. Um, that is no longer true. So mobile is now, um, you know, mobile is now uh, got to be a little bit of a different game. Again, it's a fork, so stuff is slowly gonna, you know, separate. Um, it hasn't affected us dramatically so far, but, but it will. Um, again, mobile is no longer a game. If it runs on iOS, you can count on everything. Uh, running as you expect. All right, so basically the 10% of your user base in the US is going to be on IE8, running on Windows XP, uh, or uh, running a Android browser on Android 2.3. Um, what does that mean? Uh, you can either ignore them, right? Or you can accept the fact that you've got limited CSS 2.1. Uh, basically, you can support position fixed, you know, first child, stuff like that. No CSS3 goodies. And if you try, if you pretend like IE8 has anything close to a modern JavaScript engine, uh, you're going to be sorely, sorely disappointed, right? Um, it was 
built in the pre sort of Chrome days where there wasn't the same type, you know, the same war on uh, JavaScript's uh, execution speed. Um, same thing with the Android browser on 2.3, basically no multi-touch, no SVG. JavaScript engine is fine, but it is slow, slow as hell render. All right, so. What can you do? You can basically, basically degrade any of your CSS to reduce banks. Uh, you can make sure that you're not uh, too aggressive on uh, your JavaScript. Um, obviously, if you're doing something like a game on mobile, then it is what it is. Um, you know, what I would probably recommend, depending on you know stakeholders, um, is just provide detection and warnings. So if you're trying to use Canvas or SVG, the polyfills now are sort of are, are, are putting you back far enough that you're a much better bet is is just provide a warning and say, get yourself a modern browser, right? Um, on mobile, tell them to download Firefox. On desktop, tell them to download Chrome or Firefox. Uh, or you can just ignore them entirely and then when your grandma tries to use your website. <laughs> All right, so if you're sleeping before, you can wake up. We're not going to talk about the technology, which I promise is going to be much more interesting if you're not a browser nerd. All right, so this is sort of how I like to picture the current status of the web as <laughs> rainbow cyber unicorn. Um, it's awesome. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not perfectly useful, but it is freaking awesome. All right. Um, so some of the tools that we have. Canvas, right? Basically, give me pixels. So Canvas gives us direct access, in some sense of the word, uh, to pixels. Um, support on 95% of all browsers. Basically, IE9 plus every mobile device to support the dam. Um, is hardware accelerated, so you can actually push a lot of pixels on pretty much everything except Android 2. Um, it is now realistic to run full screen, reasonably uh, performant, uh, reasonably challenging games um, uh, with Canvas. Um, and it's sort of the nice thing about it is that it, unlike something like Flash or even SVG to a lesser extent, it is a first class citizen. So sort of anything that you can do with uh, you know, with HTML and modifying the DOM and that sort of stuff, you can do with Canvas. Um, so this this great video example going around where the, you know one of the more boring parts of HTML5 is the fact that we can uh, we've got native video elements, uh, but this is a video that we're just running inside of a um, that's inside of a Canvas element, and we can just screw around with it. We can do whatever the heck we want. Um, you know, it's a little cool that uh, you know it feels a little weird that we're sort of mocking around with. Um, you know, we're mucking around with a completely separate thing, but because uh, because HTML is sort of all one thing, it's all running in one language in your browser. It's not like Flash, which is sitting entirely self-contained. Um, you know, it's that's sort of one of my favorite parts of Canvas. Um, so, um, moving on from Canvas, we've got SVG. Um, so, give me vectors. Basically, um, we've got the ability to do full sort of <coughs> full vector drawing um, uh, natively in the browser. Probably my favorite example of this is the D3 show wheel, um, which again it puts the comment at the bottom that the graphs themselves are not necessarily useful in every version that you see in here. But this is again native vector elements um, being manipulated and animated on the browser. Um, you know, this will work on your mobile device, um, and, and again, it's, uh, it's kind of a slick example. You don't necessarily want to see stock prices of the pie chart for again, that's, that's kind of not cool. Um, SVG gives a browser-provided scene graph and pixel-perfect events. So if you've got, you know, your, your perfectly drawn, shaded bunny that you want to click on, um, you know, you can click, you know, between the ears and it's not going to register a click, right? The nice thing about um, SVG versus something like Canvas, the browser is going to do all this work for us. Um, anything you know about events uh, is going to work in SVG the same sort of way that it works 
uh, in the DOM. You know, so manipulating CS, uh, CSS elements, uh, sort of CSS of uh, SVG elements, you can do the exact same thing um, with SVG. Again, we're, we're at sort of 90% of the browser public. We're looking at i9, Android 4 Plus. Um, it's one of my favorite things that it has, you know, CSS support. It's not the exact same properties you're used to. You know, you don't use background color, you use fill, but you can use uh, animations. Uh, it doesn't quite work on NRS4, but uh, there's some pretty impressive stuff you can do. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about D3 uh, a little bit later. Um, you know, the only thing that's a little bit odd is sort of in its own DOM. It's not like you can, you can sort of splash your page with SVG elements. You've got to sort of put it a little bit like you used to do with Flash in sort of its big own square box on the uh, on the page, uh, and then it'll get you know interactions, uh, click handlers, that sort of stuff. Um, all right, so. Getting progressively more complicated, we've also got WebGL. Um, it is a sibling of the exact same technology that powers almost all of our mobile games. So anything you're playing on, um, you know, playing on iOS uh, or Android is running on OpenGL ES, um, and WebGL is pretty much that <coughs> bound to a JavaScript API. So anything, plus or minus, anything you can do and see and imagine on you know, your mobile games, um, which have some fairly impressive 3D stuff going on. Uh, in theory, you can do with WebGL. A um, little less exciting, right? We're at about 60%, 67% of the browsing public. Um, if you would ask me a year ago, is Internet Explorer 11 going to support WebGL? I would say if hell froze over and they just sort of released it. It was amazing and wonderful. Um, the, and it's sort of a testament to the, uh, what power sort of web developers have just from using something, right? So the fact that WebGL became extremely popular extremely quickly, even though a small subset uh, and no mobile browsers at the time supported it, is the reason why sort of Microsoft didn't have a choice but to support it. Um, if you know sort of about the 3D space, Microsoft has their sort of DirectX stuff, which is completely the antithesis of OpenGL, right? The two don't play nice. And the idea that um, Internet Explorer would ship more or less an OpenGL implementation one of its products uh, is kind of mind-boggling. Um, and really only happened because uh, because developers were doing so much cool stuff with it, and people were showing all this cool stuff happening in these other browsers, that uh, I, I assumed that the Microsoft team was sort of like, you know, there's only so much cool stuff we can show on 2D cameras. Um, so it is not yet enabled on Safari and iOS. It's, the code is there, it's supported. There's speculation because at uh, an upcoming Apple event, there's some tracks on WebGL. There's speculation that they're going to sort of flip the switch. That would help our, help the sort of WebGL numbers pretty significantly. Um, but it is WebGL is turned on and available in Chrome, uh, Chrome for Android, Chrome Desktop, um, Firefox, Firefox Mobile, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, but you know, we're, we're sort of getting to the point where you can do some pretty impressive stuff. I'm not going to actually try to run anything on this computer, but I will show you. Um, I will show you a, uh, a video of some cool stuff. Um, I'll put this link up. There's there's sort of a great uh, uh, blog post by a company called Skira um, that talks about you know um, uh, performance of you know a reasonable, reasonably challenging to be game. Uh, running on various browsers, and you can see we're sort of at the point now where a lot of these guys are maxed out um, at 60 frames per second. Um, all right, uh, web audio. So we talked about sort of our three pretty stellar graphics options uh, with Canvas, SVG, and uh, WebGL. We've now also got web audio, which is in no way, shape, or form the same thing as HTML5 audio. Web audio is actually a real sound API suitable for real time mixing and something that game developers would not go, um, you know, would not go crazy having to use. Um, 
There's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, it's pretty much supported in everything except Internet Explorer. And this is one of those things where I hope the combined momentum of uh, the front-end developer community uh, doing cool stuff with web audio will be enough to sort of push uh, Microsoft to, to uh, support it. The cool thing is that IE actually has probably the older versions of IE uh, starting with 9 actually have some of the best low latency uh, HTML5 audio support. So you know the HTML5 audio tag that's now sort of native, you can instantiate it entirely through JavaScript. Uh, so that's, you know, again, uh, kind of um, so even, you know, you might need a fallback if you're doing something fairly advanced with HTML5, uh, you know, in the browser with audio, but at least there's something you can do with IE. Um, and like, like I said, as WebGL sort of taught us, there, if enough people use something, you the sort of browser people don't, don't really have a choice but to implement it. Um, we've got WebRTC, which is, uh, pretty amazing and sort of a feature set that it encompasses. Um, it basically enables peer-to-peer -peer communications in the browser, and if that was the only thing that it allowed, that would be awesome. But it does so much. Um, one of the things we've been missing that Flash had for a long time was audio and video capture natively in the browser. WebRTC is the goal that it is to allow with communications, um, allows that uh, natively in the browser. Um, allows peer-to-peer -peer connections. So if you're building, you know, a game or a uh, video chat app or any of these things, you don't have to run every byte of data through a centralized server. You can go from point A to point B, which obviously has wonderful, a wonderful effect on latency and a wonderful effect on your bottom line and data center costs. Um, and it also allows you to communicate audio, video. Uh, and relatively recently, a separate data channel. Um, previously, uh, from the browser, we had WebSockets, which were kind of cool, but they didn't allow sort of UDP-style unreliable connections. Um, and you might say, well, why, why are you so excited about unreliable connections? Well, if, uh, it's actually kind of a big deal, um, because if you send a packet from point A to point B, that packet might get lost somewhere along the way. But if in the meantime you set another 50 packets, and those packets are sitting waiting at the other end, uh, if all those 50 packets have to wait for that first packet, bad things happen. You get, uh, you get sort of jumps in audio and video, you get jumps in latency and multiplayer games, and so actually just being able to sort of discard packets and just take the ones that arrive is kind of really a big deal. Um, you know, you could not do streaming real-time video over TCP. It would be kind of horrible. Um, so, finally having direct access in the browser to a UDP-style and reliable channel is pretty awesome. Um, and again, this helps with audio, video, and data, and anything sort of you want to send over the wire. So, more stuff that we have. We have multi-touch, right? Natively, we have access to touch uh, sort of multi-touch on custom interfaces. Um, we have support for gamepads. The gamepad API allows us to plug in joysticks. You can plug your Xbox 360 controller uh, into your computer and in theory play a uh, game in a browser that supports it. Um, we have the vibration API, uh, which allows happy feedback, uh, which means if you're playing a little mobile game, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, you know, shake the phone when something interesting happens. Um, we now have the full screen API, which gives us, uh, you know, with a relative, you know, with a little pop-up that says, you know, the app is not full screen, lets you take over the entire browser screen, um, you know, which is great for games, full screen applications, that sort of stuff. Get rid of all the other Chrome. Um, we've got the orientation API, which allows us, you know, much like the early iPhone games where we could play like the World of Marvel game, you can do that in the browser, um, if I remember correctly. I should be able to do this. Um, the uh, Macs have actually had accelerometers for a while, so I can I can disconnect the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a 
lot better if the <coughs> computer didn't disconnect. sit there and 
and let that happen, right? You can't ever have the same piece of code run absolutely fabulously in Firefox and run horribly in Chrome. Google Ads don't sort of accept that. So now that sort of the, the gauntlet has been thrown down, um, I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, we're going to see better support for Asset.js. Um, Google definitely poo pooed it when it came out. They were not excited. They, they think something like NACL was, uh, a native client was a better option, um, from what I heard. Um, but it's sort of like now that now that they've got Unity on board, now that they have, um, you know, uh, Unreal running on it, I sort of think that the other browser makers don't have a choice. Um, and the last kind of unsexy thing um, that has really come sort of come of age in the past few years is just Divide. Um, first of all, we have mobile Divide, so if you've got an Android or an iOS device, you can actually debug that on your desktop. Uh, you don't have to pop up little alert messages everywhere to figure out what the heck is going on, right? You can, uh, which is which is huge because it's sort of like when, when we've got these mobile devices, we've got thrown back a decade. Um, and we're like, okay, now we're going to do print that. We're going to figure out how to, how to debug with that. Um, on top of it, we're kind of at the point where we have an awesome IDE in every browser, right? There, there's a better debugging environment, um, an easier to use debugging environment in every uh, in a browser that ships than you, know, you have on the server side with Rails uh, or Ruby. Um, you know, and we get basically performance auditing, memory auditing. Um, and you know, uh, basically, just a general audit of what, what the heck you're doing wrong with the website. Um, so, a bunch of favorite features. Let's those. All right. So that's sort of the tech side. Any questions or anything that I didn't mention uh, that people have sort of in uh, uh, HTML5 that they're very excited about? Have some. Flexboxes. Flexbox, yeah. So we don't have to pretend that we don't have to more or less write code like we have tables without tables anymore. So flexbox, when when it when it finally sort of hits, means that we have sort of a um, you know we can align things vertically without jumping through so many goddamn hoops. It'd be kind of exciting. Um, there's a bunch of you know there's a bunch of cool filter effects and other stuff coming out, uh, multi columns that sort of stuff. But hopefully, uh, but those are unfortunately not completely settled yet. Anything else? No more. Very much like backbone, angular, and meteor. Yeah, so those things are all good, so we'll talk about those in a sec. Uh, all right, so, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the trends. So that's the technology. We talked about the browsers. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the trends. Um, so, First trend, JavaScript MVC, right? So when, and, and not all of these are actual MVCs, but that's how we sort of like to categorize it. Um, so sort of starting in 2011, um, there was a huge uptick in interest uh, because of backbone. I don't know why previous you know, frameworks like GWT and Boot Tools didn't sort of have the same spark in the developer community. Well, I know why GWT did it because it's job. But, um, but sort of the start of the, the JavaScript MVC hype cycle started, I believe, um, with Backbone in 2011. That's that big red line that's sort of trending, trending up in the beginning. Um, and then sort of two other big players came in, uh, Ember.js and Angular.js. Um, and then just for, you know, Fun say I threw in React uh, just because uh, I think it's one of the only ones that's doing something different and it's starting to pick up a little bit of steam. Might be the next hot framework. There are about 80,000 JavaScript MVC frameworks. Um, everyone has their favorite. These are kind of the big ones. Um, so why do these exist? Well, JavaScript is an extremely flexible language, right? Um, and it got to the point that as soon as you try to do something serious with JavaScript, you basically end up with a jQuery suit. Um, or whatever horrible suit you're using if you're still on programming or something like that. Um, 
Um, so they solve the, the, J, the JavaScript organization problem, right? They give you a place for everything and everything in its place. Um, they also solve sort of the event binding and event reaction problem, right? Writing, uh, binding data to the screen and binding data to events is, is sort of a hard, a hard problem to solve and do capably with JavaScript. Um, I would say the hype sort of started with Backbone in 2011. Um, jQuery is kind of still an important piece. Um, I would say developer mindshare right now is pretty evenly split between Angular and Ember. Backbone is kind of like the, the, the old thing that people might have to use at work, but no one's really excited about anymore. Um, and React, you know, again, is, is kind of cool, kind of takes a different approach. Um, if, if you're new to this thing and you're learning, um, start with jQuery, um, and then I would say go move on to Backbone. Angular and Ember are fantastic, but they're also extremely complicated. Um, and there's, um, there's a lot of code and there's a lot of code. And probably the last thing that we need when you're figuring out the front end web development to begin with is more Voodoo than is already there. You know, you can read through the backbone source code in you know a half hour. It's annotated. It's you know very fairly nicely written. Um, I challenge anyone to read through the, all of the Angular, Ember, and Ember data just for you know, just for fun source code and not go insane. It's not going to happen. Right? So if if you're sort of getting started with this, there's still a tremendous amount of value in learning something like backbone. Even if it's not sort of the newest coolest thing. Um, simply because you're gonna um, you're gonna learn a lot, and the idea is you know the exact way that these things are done are not the same in various frameworks; they're very different. But the ideas will be the same. Um, so second big trend: SVG for database. Sort of before that, you know, we had Flash, and we sort of faked it with some you know CSS3 boxes. But SVG is very clearly the right tool for the job. Um, you know. Being able to draw things with vectors and being able to sort of click on things and have the browser do the majority of the work is fantastic. Um, it's finally widely supported without shims. Um, and if, if you know, data is then LT3 is the hammer. Um, D3 is probably uh, far and away the most popular sort of uh, visualization framework. There's a whole lot, lot of other charting libraries. If you just need a chart, you're probably better off with using something like iCharge or Google visualizations, um, just because they're going to put that bar chart up on the page much, much quicker. If you want to do something where you're actually, um, you know, where you actually need to go off the reservation a little bit or handle transitions, uh, sort of D3 is your tool. You can do a lot of very cool stuff with it. Um, it's, I don't think D3 has led to the rise of, of what people are calling JavaScript journalism, um, but it's, it's generally used. Uh, for any sort of JavaScript journalism that happens. Um, so what are we talking about with this? Well, there's a lots of great examples. Um, I think this is a relatively recent one. Um, how popular will your name be in 25 years? Um, you know, uh, time could have written an article on this, uh, and it would have been interesting, but being able to pocket something um, and actually play around with um, various names, so I can't put my name in because my name would definitely be popular. Let's try. Well, so we can now see exactly where, uh, sort of where the next peak is going forward, um, and sort of the whole thing get a little bit of animation and interactivity. Um, another great one that I think just came out. Uh, is it better to buy or rent? So this is a great one because, again, you know, the story only gets told partially by the text. Really what you want to do is you want to play around with all the sliders and sort of figure out, well, if I'm looking for a home price, you know, going big, and I want to be there for a year. Um, if I can rent for less than 13000 a month, I should buy. But again, this is the sort of thing where the story, you know, the story still gets told, but you know, each reader gets a lot more from the story, um, sort of by playing around with it. These sort of interactive visualizations are definitely um, uh, 
you know, definitely add a lot more uh, than you might get just on the printed page. And so we finally have sort of a use for the medium of the web besides just as something that's taking print and throwing it sort of on the page. Um, a lot of these are from the New York Times. Um, and all these, all these examples I'm showing by far the most popular ones are like USB 3. Um, Fireballs from outer space. Wonderful. Um, and so you know you can drag, you can see where where stuff was happening. You know, you can really sort of look at this stuff. It's something you're interested in from a whole bunch of different angles. Um, and so this is again the power that E3 gives you above and beyond um, you know, just drawing a long chart. This one is extremely old. This is from 2008. But this is actually the one that got me super excited about this stuff in the first place. Um, I remember sitting, uh, you know, sitting before the election, if you guys remember, uh, not 2012, um, so it's not that old. It's, it's still sort of on the earlier side of the D3 stuff. Um, and all the pundits are talking about, you know, is Obama going to win? Is Romney going to win? Blah, blah, blah. And then the uh, New York Times came out with this and just sort of played around with it. You are like, huh, Obama wins Ohio. There's not that many options for Romney. Oh, if Obama just wins Florida, not that many options for Romney. And so you're sitting there and you're playing around with this thing. And you're like, wow, all the pundits are talking about this extremely close race. But like, you really feel empowered as a, you know, just sort of someone playing around with you. Like, you know, maybe that's really not the case. Because, you know, I'm playing around with the data and I'm seeing something completely different. So this is one of those cases where I think, you know, interactive visualization really was extremely powerful. Um, you know, I think this led, uh, one of the examples that led to a lot of sort of the interest in sort of downstream journeys, right? Telling a story, but, but putting the, the, the user in, in sort of in that story. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in, start playing around with E3. Um, it's a very, you know, it's a very fine-grained library, and there's a lot of math, so if you're not playing math, um, you know, do something else. Um, but it is a wonderful tool. Um, I would also say we're sort of in the post-responsive era, right? <laughs> I would say we hold these truths to be self-evident. Sites need mobile experiences, right? If you're looking at one-third of your web, tra web traffic, uh, is coming from mobile, you, you can't just act like that doesn't exist, right? Um, and there's no guarantee on keyboard size, right? Someone's coming in with their mini tablet, someone's coming in with their gargantuan tablet, someone's coming in with their tiny, you know, barely a smartphone Android. You sort of have to deal with whatever the web is throwing at you. Um, so there's no, you know, I would go as far as say responsiveness is almost a given, right? If you're if you're showing the user content and your site is not responsive, um, you are going to be losing people, you know, very very quickly. Um, but why I'm calling this both responsive is it's not sort of the final one size fits all solution, right? If you have an interactive application and you take the exact same experience and you just make it responsive with a couple media queries, that's not the solution either. Right? People interact very differently uh, on a mobile device than they do on a desktop browser. Um, you know, for one, we have multi-touch on a mobile device. We've got fat fingers, so we can't have tiny little buttons that we might be able to get to with our mouth with our mouse. So it's not, you know, um, you can't just say, you know, my website plus media queries equals fantastic mobile screen. You really have to sort of think about it uh, and think about experiential design. For, for the user, uh, as opposed to just media queries. Uh, so, so the last trend I would call HTML everywhere. So HTML5, um, the platform, not the browser technology necessarily, I would say has won. Uh, who, did it, who did it beat? Who was lying on the floor bloody and didn't matter? Um, Flash, pretty clearly, uh, is, is no longer the sort of uh, platform uh, of choice. Uh, considering that you can't even really get get at it in the browser uh, on either iOS or Android, um, the uh, you know who else has to be various other prototyping libraries. 
various other desktop uh, application frameworks. Um, you know, for a lot of these, it is kind of the prototyping language for all the things. Um, and it's also sort of become the de facto sandbox, right? If you want to run something and you don't want to have to think about whether you need to trust it, so the browser is sort of the last bastion of safety for going anywhere and running anything. Um, we've also got things like LLVM and ASM.js, which basically you can take, um, you know, with various connectors, you can take some C code, you know, run it through a transpiler and throw it in the browser. Uh, people have done this with everything up to and including the entire Linux kernel, right? So you can run pretty much whatever you want sitting in a little sandbox of the browser, which is pretty badass. Um, and I would go as far as to say, yeah, JavaScript is the new basic, right? So if you were, if you grew up in the 80s like I did, right, the language you learned if you were a nerd back in the day was basic, right? That's how you got your, got your start. Um, now, if, if you're learning on anything but JavaScript, um, it's kind of weird. Every single, you know, we give every kid a browser, which means we give every kid an IDE. Um, but on the flip side, the browser is dead. It's been dying every couple of years due to one thing or another. Um, why is it dying today? You want to take guess? Apps, right? Apps clearly killed the browser, right? It is dead. No one uses browsers anymore on mobile. Ignore, of course, the fact that the browser is by far the most used uh, uh, mobile app in existence. And on top of it, you talk about sort of the browser is dead, and yet when you look at what people are counting as numbers, most of the time when you click on something inside of Facebook or Twitter on your mobile application, you're actually going into a sort of embedded browser, right? What you click on inside of your mobile application as you're looking at all this content and sort of cat memes is a browser. It's not going to register as sort of Chrome or Safari or whatever, right? But that's what it is. So sort of the web is still sort of the interconnected tissue that holds sort of our entire sort of online world together, regardless of the fact that you know, we now have deep linking on iOS and all this other stuff, right? So the web, as much as people want to claim the browser is dead, um, I'd say it is still very much sort of you know, everything that connects us together, right? Um, and our, and this is sort of the, the next case CD that I think captures it pretty well. Um, <laughs> some things have gone so fast and painless. Why not skip it entirely and make a phone that has every app, quote unquote, install already and just downloads and runs them on the fly? That would be kind of awesome, right? I realized, uh, I felt pretty clever until I realized I just invented web pages, right? We sort of have this extremely powerful tool and we're going to spend the next 10 years sort of doing the same thing with mobile apps again until we realize, hey, well, that's a pretty awesome thing, right? I can have this deep link from someplace, you know, in Cambridge, all the way to someplace in China, uh, and you know, and they're all connected, right? And then people are going to jump through all these hoops on how do you have, you know, how do you make one mobile app talk to another mobile app and web intents and all that other stuff. The web solves a lot of these problems. I have a feeling as much as we're in sort of the application hype cycle, um, and you know, browsing new school decline, right? Um, because there are you know, there are significant performance advantages to mobile apps. Sort of HTML5 is still going to stick around, uh, probably much more than people think. Um, and the cool thing is now we're pretty much at feature parity with Flash in 2007, which is nice, um, without the browser penetration numbers. So when we get sort of super excited about how awesome HTML5 is, it's kind of nice to remember that you know Flash was doing live video recording and stuff way back when. And we're sort of only slowly sort of reaching that level right now, right? We can play a game without the intermittent GC sort of stumbles. Um, so when we get super excited, we sort of have to sort of remember this to put us in our place. All right. Um, so any questions sort of on the trends or any other trend you guys are seeing that um, that you think is something you know worth talking about? Do you have any information on what components? On what components? What components? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that much about them, to be honest with you. Is there someone that's sort of big into web components? Um, 
you know, I think I think they're going to be interesting as long as they're sort of widely adopted. Uh, you know, if I'm saying this correctly, I think I think what they're going to solve is a lot of sort of the sort of the big thing we didn't talk about with HTML is all the security issues that are associated with combining a whole bunch of content on the page together. I think Web Components solves that a little bit, um, but honestly, I don't I don't know that much about it. So, uh, so this this is entirely not tech related. So again, your, mi your mileage may vary. Um, I'd love you know if other people uh, who are doing hiring or, or are looking to get hired, um, you know, we, we sort of let's have a discussion together. But you are unfortunately because I'm here holding the microphone, I'm going to have to listen to my opinions. Um, so, if you are an experienced developer and you have an up to date skill set. You should be okay. You should be able to get a job. Uh, if if you can't, um, you know there's probably some things that are worth looking at how you're, you know, how you're presenting and your interview style, that sort of thing. Nationally, there's a 2.7 percent unemployment rate for tech people. In Boston, I would garner that that, is, that number is down further. So if you are an experienced, you know, tech guy or gal with a skill set from this decade, um, you know, again, you know, minus all the ageism that you know, happens in tech, um, you know, you should, you should be able to get a job. And obviously that's, you know, pissing people off for It's all right, that's how the people in second too. Um, if you're a junior dev and you're sort of new on the market, this is where I see a lot of uh, problems with people finding jobs. Um, and sort of, uh, this is sort of my list of why juniors or people that don't have, uh, you know, are new to the, uh, new to the market uh, are a tough hire for a company. Uh, one, you don't necessarily have a track record. Um, two, there's the issue of job mobility, right? Uh, people aren't sticking around at jobs as long, which means that, you know, companies are saying, well, I don't want to train some dude for however months, you know, many months, and then have them jump off to a higher paying job. Um, that sort of goes hand in hand with millennial fashion, which is everyone, you know, over 35's favorite second job. Um, the 10x methodology, right? The idea that, you know, you get the right developer, they're going to sort of have the 10x of the ability that, you know, like the sort of other developer might have, which is a lot of people say, well, hiring a plus 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 people. Um, the tech stack variety, right? So if one company is, you know, Rails, Ruby shop, and another is a Django shop, or, you know, companies using one specific MVC framework and you don't have experience in that, it's going to be tough to get hired. Um, and also, if you're, you're not necessarily a known quantity, right? People can't say, I know what you did, and I know, you know, what you're going to do. So how do we get around that? Um, so I think the solution is extremely simple. You simply have to be awesome. Uh, you know, and, and I'm not kidding. Like, uh, if, if you want to make a significant, if you want to get hired and have people running after you, right, you either need to be awesome or you need to convince people you're awesome. So one, one of those two. Um, my favorite sort of mini blog article uh, is basically the secret of success uh, in the internet world is do things and tell people. It's kind of simple, but like do something and then tell people about the awesome thing that you did. And because, you know, one, everyone's on the internet. Any URL you have, anyone in the world can get to. It means you can do something that interests a tiny little subsection of the population, right? And then you can tell everyone about it and, you know, you might be able to winnow down the people who are interested your skills are interested in what you're passionate about. Um, so, so if you take a look at this slide, please do read this. Um, you know, it's relatively short, but it's about, you know, they sort of talk about, you know, this Khan Academy, uh, Wikipedia Code Academy, like all the knowledge is out there, right? There's no one stopping you from doing whatever the heck it is you want to do. Um, so these uh, two kids basically made a um, HTML5 game engine, and because they did that, it, you know, they blogged about it, they talked about it, and they got, you know, internships at Ericsson. Um, so again, it's kind of simple. Do something cool, tell people about it. Um, 
job ability. So one thing I would say, if you are a junior dev hiring, you know, uh, looking for a position, um, don't come across as selfish, right? And do your homework, right? So don't show up to an interview and know nothing about the company, and don't show up to an interview, and this, you know, obviously applies across the board, don't keep talking about the things that are, um, the things that are important to you, right? That is by far the most important thing to you, right? What's, what actually is gonna make you happy in your job, but if that's the only thing you talk about in the interview, you know, the first thing the person on the other side of the table is gonna think about is basically, uh, you know, this, this person doesn't care about the company, doesn't care about our mission, didn't do their homework, uh, and they're just sort of gonna take this job long enough um, to have to do what it needs to do for them. If that's, you know, if that's what you're doing, that's fine, but just don't have that come across in the interview, right? Um, so there's also the tiny, tiny mythology, right? Well, the cool part is you can use that to your advantage. If you can sort of plant that seed, you know, jump on it through hackathons, do a startup weekend, show this sort of awesome stuff that you can get done in a short period of time, that might get people thinking, like, oh, maybe this is just sort of one of those 10x, 20x's sort of been waiting, right? Um, so, so again, do something awesome, um, and then you can sort of, companies are gonna be extremely excited just to sort of snap that up. Um, on the tech stack variety thing, obviously there's only, much time, only so much time in the world. Um, so what I would say is focusing, focus on doing stuff, right? And doing stuff in, in sort of various environments, various tech stacks, um, and show your quick study, right? If, if, you, if you've literally got a monoculture of products, sit, products sitting on GitHub, you're not, necessi uh, excuse me, not necessarily going to come off as this sort of uh, super multi-talented developer, right? Uh, I can't actually remember what these links are. Right, so here's this great example of this dude who basically said, I'm gonna build a game uh, a week for 12 weeks. Uh, and he hadn't built the game before, and by the end, um, he built sort of 12 different games. They had, you know, they're very simple graphics because he's a developer, but they all were, were actually pretty cool. Um, you know, and he sort of came, you know, in 12 weeks, he came out of nowhere. Um, and, you know, people are talking about him. People are linking to him in presentations. Um, this lady basically built 180 websites in 180 days. I'm not saying you have to go to that extent, but, you know, she's doing talk and speaking tours, and she's got a book and other stuff, right? Um, this is pretty cool, but there's no one here that physically could not have done this. You have, you know, I'm sure you have a, a life or something else going on, <laughs> but um, there's no reason why you couldn't do this, right? Uh, if you sort of dedicated to it. So like no one is ever stopping you from doing something awesome. Um, it's just sort of, you know, the idea of just waiting around and finding that right job by sending in 8,000 resumes is probably not the solution anymore. Um, and the last thing is be a known quantity, right? So network. Um, Notice I don't say self promote. You know, that doesn't mean that, you know, at every meetup you have to get up and say, you know, I'm blah, 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 and I'm looking for a job, please hire me. That's self promotion, right? Networking is showing up to, you know, events, meeting people, uh, meeting people from companies that are hiring. And once you've seen your face for a while, um, you know, you, you sort of become a known quantity, someone that, you know, the, someone would hire or trust to hire, right? So I think this is sort of the thing that took me the longest to learn. Um, all right. So, so any, so that's sort of my my advice on jobs and hiring. You know, I've been hiring sort of since, um, you know, since probably 2008. Various passes. Anything else or anything from the other side that you give us advice? As, as someone who's going to beg all of you to come work for me at the Globe a little later, the one thing I'm going to say is this. Don't tell me you know HTML5 and CSS3. In this day and age, if you don't know those, no. <laughs> Not trying to be mean, but this this is 2014. Those technologies you, you should know. If you're trying to sell yourself on those technologies, you're doing yourself a disservice more yeah. than anything else. And I throw in along with that, you probably don't need to put Word and Excel on your resume anymore. Right? Cool. Like, these are sort of things that I've accepted. Show off the sort of interesting nuggets that you know. Anyone else? So more and more people are 
asking questions like in interviews. So what do you do outside of your day job? What projects are you taking on? What open source projects are you working on? How many pull requests do you have open on GitHub? How many of them have been accepted? Those kinds of things really make a difference when you're in a, in a uh, interview situation. Yeah, I mean, so, so I was going to put up a slide that basically said GitHub is your resume is bullshit because people love to say that. Um, if it is your resume and you do, you are committing to a bunch of, uh, of open source projects and you have pull requests open and all that stuff, it 100% is, right? That's one of those be awesome things. That's if you can get yourself involved in a bunch of projects, you look at that as someone's hiring and you sell it, right? Um, if, if what you're doing on GitHub is pushing a whole bunch of random projects that you know are just you sitting happy by yourself, that's less of a resume, right? So 100%. If you're if you're doing that, like that's awesome. Most most people I see are not. So that's a very easy like step if you're involved uh, to do. You know that would be something that you you would sort of expect from a senior person. From a junior person, you see that you you it's awesome. Else. Stack Overflow? Stack Overflow definitely does not hurt either. Right? If you've got a solid reputation on Stack Overflow, again, one of those things that you look at um, you know, as, as self hiring is awesome. All right. So, how are we doing? All right. So, your skill set as a developer, right? HTML is sitting as your bedrock. CSS is sort of, I don't know, your, your under soil, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> JavaScript, is sort of, JavaScript is sort of your top soil that gets the, that provides sort of the, the most nutrient rich, um, you know, uh, soil for your crops, right? You obviously need to know the basics about HTML. Um, you need to be able to lay things out on a page. If someone says, what is the box model, and your eyes, you know, you have no idea what it is, that's bad, right? <laughs> like, this basic stuff should not be voodoo. Don't go right, like, don't go right from, I want to learn web development, to I'm going to learn Ember.js, right? There's a whole bunch of steps in between. If you don't take those steps, you're sitting, you're sitting in voodoo land, and you have no idea about anything that's happening, right? Um, so, you know, you need those bottom layers. You don't have to be a superstar at them, right? But you need those bottom layers because if you don't, if you're not solid in your HTML your layout, you can't put things on the page where you want to, um, let alone manipulate them with JavaScript. Um, ideally, you should start with very young. <laughs> and other new dads, I just want to know, I successfully put a baby picture into my presentation. <laughs> so if you are a newbie, um, you're actually not at as much of a disadvantage as you might think if you're kind of entirely new to this stuff. Because a lot of people that started, you know, back in 2000 or 2004, you know, still think tables and image ready are, you know, the way to go. Um, if you are learning sort of the newest stuff right off the bat, you don't have all this cruft in the back of your mind about how things used to be done or should be done, right? Um, so it's not, you know, don't feel like you're at a huge disadvantage. If you understand HTML and CSS, uh, you can do a lot and you can be hire hireable without all the skill sets and all the APIs and all the other stuff that we talked about. All that stuff is gravy on top of doing cool stuff. But if you can lay out a page and make it look good, uh, people will hire you, right? Um, so start with HTML, move on to CSS, um, and then learn JavaScript. And then, you know, in lieu of learning a completely different language, learn about JS, which is basically a server that runs JavaScript, right? That's sort of your best path as a new um, If you're a designer, just add HTML and CSS to your skill set. Um, the way that uh, Designers who can also code are, are referred to uh, in the industry is unicorn. So they are this rare, fantastic beast. So if you can, if you have a top-notch designer that can also 
take their design, implement it in the browser, that is absolutely wonderful. So you don't, you know, ignore the JavaScript part to begin with. Just become reasonably proficient at HTML, CSS, and you'll be sublimely hireable. Um, and then sort of add in design in the browser, in the browser, and you, being able to understand sort of responsive and media queries. Um, and that is an absolutely wonderful thing without even knowing how to program, right? Just being able to write enough code to get it done and not being afraid of a text editor uh, will make you a, a wonderful <laughs> um, And yet, it's all UX these days, right? So if you sort of throw on, if you, if, if you have the ability to throw that on your resume legitimately, um, again, that is a wonderful thing. And finally, developer, um, you are probably already hired if you came out of school with a CS degree. Um, or you know, uh, or very close to it. Um, I would say embrace JavaScript. Uh, my story is, you know, when I graduated from college back in the day, uh, I started doing web development. And I graduated in the first dot com bust, because um, that was the only thing where people would pay me. And I was like, in back mind, I was like, no, I'm always going to get back to like real development at some point. I'm always, gonna, you know, at some point, I'm just sitting on a Windows machine, you know, coding, coding up, you know, uh, MFC and all that stuff. Um, and it went the other way, right? Like, if you're sitting doing client-side apps in C++ right now, um, you know, the future's kind of left it behind a little bit. The web is where all the, all the excitement is, right? So if you're graduating from college with very little JavaScript skills, I would say learn those as quickly as possible, or you're gonna spend the rest of your life, you know, debugging Fortran applications for the DOD, um, you know, the front end is sort of where it's at. Um, learn an MVC or four, um, and I don't think it, they're not necessarily called unicorns, but people get very excited if you're a legitimate full stack developer, right? If you can go from the back, back end, from the database all the way through the front end, um, that is a very marketable and valuable skill. It also makes you very valuable to yourself, because you can sit down and you can code something, you can have an idea, and you can sort of put it, you know, put it on the web yourself. Um, most developers sort of treat HTML success with this severe level of disdain um, because you know they're not real code, right? Um, the thing is, we have enough cool cool tools like Less and SAS, um, you know, and Haml and all these things that make HTML and CSS a little less painful. Um, and if you sort of treat them as crafts as opposed to as this you know sort of terrible thing that you're stuck with, um, you know, you you will be all the better for it. And it does not hurt to, hurt to sort of learn enough design to be dangerous. Um, you are not going to become a designer and understand typography and hierarchy overnight, right? But if you can sort of read a couple books, read a little bit, you know, of Steve Krug um, on UX, you know, that, that will do tremendous things for your value as a company. All right, so that is it. Um, and of course, we're hiring as well. <laughs> Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, pizza is here thanks to Don uh, from Trinity Pharma. Trinity Pharma. Right. Um, so thanks, thank you for the pizza.